I'm a pretty disciplined person, self-motivated, hardworking. And back in the summer of 2018, I was not eating well. I wasn't exercising. And one particular night, my wife and I went to The Fix in Worcester for dinner. And we got pulled pork nachos as an appetizer. Then it came time to order a meal and I ordered a giant burger with bacon and an egg on top of it. And that night, you can imagine how I was feeling. I was feeling bloated, disgusting. And I woke up at 3 a.m. feeling absolutely awful. And so it's the middle of the night. What did I do? At three o'clock in the morning, I drove to Planet Fitness and I joined the gym. Talk about motivation. I was determined to get in shape again. I could see it already, the six pack abs, running marathons, maybe even competing in one of those like Ninja Warrior obstacle courses. You know, people on the street, I imagine them just stopping me and saying, what's your secret? And I just say, discipline, right? Guess how many times I used that gym membership? One time. That one time at 3 a.m. is the only time that I went to the gym that year. My motivation and discipline lasted about as long as the nachos the night before. Meanwhile, Planet Fitness just kept collecting $20 out of my bank account every single month. And for a whole year, my gym bag sat in the corner just silently judging me every time I walked by. Like, hey, remember me? We had big plans, right? Have you ever had a 3 a.m. plan but lacked the 3 p.m. persistence? Of course you have because... We all have. You can make all the commitments in the world, but, but you can have all the desire to make this change in your life, but you're gonna fail and I will fail and we will all fail if we don't have this one thing that we're talking about today. The one thing that's missing in your life. Because at the end of the day, we drift. We drift. If it's good for us, we drift from it. And maybe like me six years ago, it's exercise, but you keep drifting from your exercise routine and from the gym, or, or maybe it's dieting. You've tried the Atkins diet, the Weight Watchers, the Whole30, keto, juice cleanses, you know, but you keep drifting from that diet. Maybe it's budgeting and staying on a budget. And you want so desperately to get a handle on your finances to really start reining in your spending, but you find yourself drifting from the budget. Maybe it's priorities. You want to prioritize your kids, you pri prior prioritize your spouse, but, but you keep working late and work keeps cutting into that. And maybe it's an addiction you've been fighting and it's been just this uphill battle for you. You're trying to change, you're trying to, to, to bring about this change in your life, but you keep falling down again and again, drifting from everything that's, that's good for you. See, the gravitational pull of our lives is always in the wrong direction. Like we don't naturally drift into healthy relationships. No married couple ever just wakes up 10 years in and thinks, wow, we've put no work into this marriage, but we're crushing it. No, we, we drift into, uh, we, we drift apart from that. We, we don't drift into a healthy financial life. If you're not intentional in your financial practices of saving and investing, you're gonna probably be living paycheck to paycheck. And this is true of our faith as well, if you don't have this one thing that we're talking about today, your faith is going to drift. Your faith might turn into doubt. Your commitment will wane and you'll find yourself distant from God and missing the community and the relationship that you once had with him. So as we start this two-part series today, we're gonna to be talking about the one thing that's missing from your life. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give it to you up front today. You know, what is missing from so many of our lives is community. The one thing missing is community, but not just any community, but what, let me ask this question, what type of community will stop the drift in our lives? What type of community will allow us to really dig in and persevere through, uh, through those things? And I'm not talking about the community that you might have with your drinking buddies or the type of community you have with the other moms at the PTA, you know, Parent Teacher Association. I'm talking about a different type of community, a community that has the capacity to actually help you stop the drift in whatever aspect and, and part of your life that you want to stop drifting in. A community that can, that, that can help you to intentionally move into healthier directions. But this is not a new struggle to us. It's the same struggle since the beginning. Uh, and today, as we dive into the Bible, we're going to be reading a passage from the New Testament of our Bibles found in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. 
And Hebrews is found towards the end of the Bible. It comes right after the life of Jesus and after Paul's letters. And it's actually written by an unknown author. We don't know who it is, but it was primarily written to Christians who had converted from Judaism. So they were previously Jewish people, now converted to Christianity. And these were second generation Christians. And they were tempted to drift back into old practices from their former religion, to go back to the old covenant. And the drift was too, true 2,000 years ago, and it's true today as well. We're all tempted at times to drift back into old practices. But the author writes to them about something that is missing from their lives that needs to be added in. And the author writes this. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Who would ever want to turn away from the living God? You know, the God that you've experienced, that you've had these mountaintop experiences, who would turn away? Who would hear when God says, go this way and then go the opposite direction? Well, Paul, the, the writer of half of the New Testament, understands this well when he writes in Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Have you ever felt that way? That the things that you do are the things you, you want to stop doing. The things that you want to stop doing are the things you just keep doing. And here's the reality is that everyone has the capacity to turn away from God and from the life that he has for us. Regardless of how long you've believed, how strong your faith is, how many verses you've memorized, how many people you've told about Jesus, how much you give to the church, we all have the same capacity to turn away from God. And you might say, well, no, Matt, that's never going to be me. I'm never turning my back on God. I will always follow him the rest of my life. But this warning in Hebrews is a warning for all of us. In fact, if you were to translate the, the, the verse 12 uh, in, from, from the Greek into English, it would actually read it this way. I would say, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of y'all. Now, let me just explain. We don't have a word in the English language that distinguishes between you singular and you plural, except to just use the Southern drawl, y'all, right? <laughs> this, is, this is plural. What I mean by that is that when he says that none of you, he's not talking to one person. He's talking to a whole audience of people. The author is saying that this is true, not just for one individual, but it's true for the entire community of all of us, that all of us have the same capacity to drift in our families, to drift in our finances, to drift in our faith. In fact, maybe that's the reason you're watching today, that you used to believe and you used to follow, but it's been weeks, maybe months since you've stepped foot in a church, maybe even years. Why do we turn away from the living God when we when we go to college and suddenly we start to dismantle our faith like a house of cards? Why do we turn away from the living God when we go on a business trip and trade our values and trade our commitment for whatever catches our eye that night? Why do we turn away from, from the living God the moment we leave the church parking lot and flip somebody off in traffic on the way home? Why do we turn away from God after having these mountaintop experiences that we can't deny? or after valley experiences where we start to doubt his goodness. So, so what's the answer, right? What is missing from our lives that will stop the drift? And it's right there in a the text that says, see to it, brothers and sisters. We need brothers and sisters in our lives to see to us. Now, the Greek word for see is the word blepete, blepete, uh, which is a Greek word. It means to see but also means to know and to perceive. And so it's more than just seeing someone on the outside, right? We're pretty good at seeing people on the outside, but it's about seeing the heart of the matter, the heart of the person. So let me ask you a question. Who sees you? Who sees you? Who knows you? Who is seeing to you? See, that kind of seeing doesn't just happen when we come on a Sunday morning in a large community. Uh, it, let's just like talk through a typical Sunday morning coming to church, right? So you wake up, 
You're already five minutes behind schedule. You stumble into your kids' rooms to get them dressed. The, your oldest cooperates, but your youngest spends 15 minutes in the nude trying to sort through like three different outfits and they're just pulling things out of their dresser. And you finally get everybody dressed. And just as you're about to leave, you realize the baby had a vo volcanic diaper blowout that just made its way all the way up their back. So you're back inside wrestling with wipes and praying for patience. You finally get everybody into the car. And if that wasn't stressful enough, now your kids are in the back seat and they're turning on each other. He hit me while she was annoying me and wouldn't stop. And you try to just hold back your anger, but the baby's crying. And then to top it all off, someone cuts you off on the road. And then the Dunkin' Donuts lady, bless her heart, she, she gives you an iced coffee instead of a hot coffee. And you're basically one sip away from losing your salvation. You pull up to church, you take a deep breath, you wipe the donut crumbs off your kids' faces. You fix your makeup, slap your best church smile on. And then as you're walking in, someone greets you. Good morning, how you doing today? And you just respond with, blessed beyond measure. Blessed beyond measure, brother. How about yourself? Right? We, 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 we have to kind of fake it a little bit when we come into community. We, we feel this need to kind of pretend and to be someone that we're not. But something that we say around here is this. We say, circles are better than rows. Rows don't see. When you come and you sit in a row, shoulder to shoulder with other people, you know, you, you, you're not really known. We come together on Sundays to get fueled up and inspired to go live out our faith the rest of the week. That's important, but that's not enough. So you can come and you can sit side by side with others and no one can truly know how your marriage is. No one can truly know about your depression and your loneliness. No one can truly know that you're struggling in school or struggling in your workplace. But when you get in a circle, in a small group with other people, you're surrounding yourself with other people who can see you and be seen by you. Someone needs to see to you, to, to know you. Why? Because all drifting begins within. All drifting begins Within, As the writer says, he says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the, the, the living God. Here's the reality is that all drifting begins in our hearts. It's these little compromises that we make in the interior of our being. You don't just wake up one day and decide, you know, I've been sober for 10 years, but today's the day I'm just going to get hammered. You know, I, I've never had an adulterous thought in my life, but today I think I'd like to cheat on my spouse. No, nobody says that. Nobody says, you know, today I've decided to quit my job, leave the kids and walk out. I don't know what it is, but I'm just making that decision today. No one says, I believed in Jesus yesterday, but today I think I'm just done. You know, turning away and drifting is this gradual condition that begins in our hearts and left unchecked, that drift leads us to places that we never intended to go. It leads us to places that we swear we would never go. And so you need someone in your life that sees you, but, but seeing's not enough. You need more. We need to encourage one another. To encourage one another. That's the next verse. He, he says to encourage, which means the Greek word actually means to urge, to exhort, or it might even mean to, to beg someone. I mean, this is the idea of something called accountability. Accountability. And, and that's one of those like kind of words that we do not like today. To hold someone accountable is always a negative thing. But what if in this context, he's saying this is something that's missing from your life. This is something that's, that's valuable to your life. And it's actually one of the key components of, of what you're going to experience when you get in a small group with other people. You may have adopted the notion that your life's decisions are nobody else's business. And that's fine. That's fine. It's selfish, but it's fine. Because here's the truth. That your decisions, they impact other people. Your decisions impact the people who love you. You know, we tend to think that how I date and how I dress and how much alcohol I consume and what I do when no one's looking, that that's nobody else's business. But we got to get out of the way of our selfish way of thinking and living and realize that there's six billion other people on this planet who have the potential to be impacted by my decisions. And so your spouse is impacted by your decisions. 
Your kids are impacted by your decisions. Your parents and your grandparents and your coworkers, they are all impacted by the decisions that you make. I mean, let me put it this way. Doesn't it hurt or anger you when someone you love makes a decision that you disagree with? Have you ever been at a wedding and wanted to just scream, I object? Like, you know that that couple is making a huge mistake. They're not good for each other. You, you, you want to just stand up and be that person. Or you see your kids making decisions that are just not good or, or, or they, they bring, uh, your, your daughter brings a boyfriend home that you disapprove of, you know, you get time to get the shot, right? You, you see someone making poor financial decisions in their life and you're just like, another credit card is really what you need, right? You see someone drift away from their spouse into a dangerous friendship and, you know, it's amazing how we could just have the most clear insights into other people's blind spots and stupid decisions, but did you ever consider that there's a friend saying the same thing about you? There's someone who's looking at the way you live your life and saying, I wouldn't have done it that way. And so it's good for someone to see you, to encourage you, to urge you, and if need be, to beg you not to make a bad decision that's gonna blow up your life. And so he says to encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. Now, this gives us a frame, a, a framework, a time frame to work with that each of us has the capacity to drift every single day. Every single day. I have this, this, this longing in my heart to drift away from God. And so I need someone in my life today. As long as it's called today means as long as you are breathing, as long as you're alive, you need someone to speak into your life to see to you and encourage you and exhort and beg you. And so as long as your heart's still beating, you're capable of retreating. And the reason is this. He says, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, sin, and it's kind of personified in this passage, the sin is like this person that lives inside of us and it deceives us. It causes us to lie to ourselves, saying things like, well, I deserve this. I need this. I owe it to myself. Have you ever heard someone say that? You know, or maybe they, 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 they say things like, well, she practically forced me to do it. It's her fault, right? And you, you have that victim mentality. They're deceiving themselves by sin. Or you might say, well, if I don't do this, I'm never gonna be happy. So I need to pursue this and I will find happiness. Like whatever justification we use, it eventually will harden our hearts. The more we listen to the voice of sin, the less we let others in. And so sin here is is this person that's living inside of us, calling the shots and ultimately making you a slave to that voice. Now you can be a slave to the voice of me or you can actually truly be free by allowing others to see you. Self-deception begins to lose its power when you speak out loud the thoughts that you thought that, that, that you would never say out loud. You know, our our hardened hearts begin to melt when we expose the lie that we've been believing about ourselves or about the world or about our marriage. We say that to a trusted friend. So what are the things that you tell yourself that if you said out loud would make you sound a little crazy? You might say, well, I can't tell anyone that because they're gonna think I'm crazy. But what if you're gonna realize that you're not alone? You're not the only person who has had those thoughts, that others have had those same thoughts, those same thoughts of depression, those same thoughts of of, of retreating and going a different direction. And actually saying it out loud is what could keep you from actually becoming crazy. So the last verse here is this in verse 14. He says, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. It's not enough to begin well. It's not enough to have a 3 a.m. gym membership and never come back. It's not enough to have a 3 a.m. plan, but not the 3 p.m. perseverance. Your wedding day is not sufficient evidence of your marriage. You have to daily live it out. The prayer you prayed 10 years ago at camp or 20 years ago at camp, it's not sufficient evidence of your faith. You gotta walk that out daily, holding your original conviction firmly to the very end. Don't throw it all away someday because you didn't let someone in today. So here's the big point that I wanna make today. The drift begins within. So let someone in. 
The drift begins within. It's, it's in the heart of hearts where we be, begin to drift away. So let someone in today. Let someone see you and encourage you so that, so that you continue to, to follow. So you continue to be faithful and stop drifting in your life. So what that means is that you need to have a place where people see to you on a regular basis so that you won't be tricked by, by sin and deceived by it and drift away from God. If you want to break free from the power of sin, the power of selfishness and addiction, then you've got to let somebody in. If you want to have a marriage that lasts, you've got to let somebody in. If you want to be a better spouse, a better parent, coworker, a better leader, you've got to let someone in to see you. Because the natural current of our lives doesn't drift towards health and wholeness. But when you have brothers and sisters surrounding you who are seeing to you and encouraging you every single day, that's how you swim upstream. That's how you go against the grain and against the tide of this world that pulls us further and further from everything that's good and healthy for us. The drift begins within. So let someone in. That's what's missing from your life. And here at Faith, we've designed that place for you. We call it Faith Groups. And Faith Groups is a place where you're going to experience accountability, belonging, and care. And, and they're a place where you'll gather with 8 to 12 other people once a week for encouragement to help you stay the course in your faith, in your marriage, in your family. And there are, let me just say, there are no perfect small groups because there's no perfect people. You might join a group where you just don't like some of the people, and that's okay. You might join a group where you love the people, and that's great. But there are not perfect groups, but there are purposeful groups. As I said earlier, your drinking buddies and the other parents in, in the PTA, they, they can't give you what's truly missing from your life. Because they don't probably don't see you in the same way that a small group of people who are all going the same direction together to pursue faith and to pursue accountability. That's where you experience the thing that's missing from your life. So when you join a small group of faith church, here's what you're going to experience. You're going to experience the ABCs of group life. This is how we like to think of it. Accountability, which we talked about today, belonging, and care. And as much as we list them in this order, they actually happen in the opposite order. Because as you are cared for in community, you experience the feeling of belonging to a family where you can be real and authentic and take off the mask and, 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 and be known and then grown. And this opens you up to then receive accountability where people see to you and encourage you so you don't drift. And so today, uh, group link is happening. But if you can't make it to group link, then we would encourage you to still sign up for a group and scan the QR code on the screen right here. And when you scan that QR code, it's going to take you to a, a list of all of our available open small groups. And we have groups in different stages of life, different areas of town, different nights of the week. And our hope is to connect you into a group so that you can experience the ABCs of group life and ultimately experience what's missing from your life. So if you're not in a small group, I would encourage you to try a group out this fall. Try it out for this fall for a few months and see if you don't experience that sense of accountability, belonging, and care. Now, if you're new to Christianity, to Jesus, or to the Bible, then I want you to sign up for Alpha. And Alpha is a small group for those who want to get into the basics of the faith. And, and Alpha is the first group. So when you scan this QR code, it's the first group that you're gonna see on that page. And so when you do that, you'll see Alpha pop up right at the top. Let's pray right now. Father, I just uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for this word written to these Christians 2000 years ago, that we have this propensity in us to drift from everything that's good and healthy for us. But God, I pray that this fall, as we get into community, that we get into circles and small groups, God, that we would be known and grown in the, in the presence of accountability, God, as we open ourselves up to be seen by other people and to be encouraged by other people. God, that we would see marriages flourish. We would see families healed. We would see lives restored, God, that we would see just your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven through the community that we experience this fall. 
God, we thank you and we pray this in your name. Amen.